how do you deal with that sort of a problem? Um, yeah, so I mean, just you're right, of course. And just to be clear, I was uh, prognosticating about what might happen if we basically are uh, devoting significant portions of our resources to fact checking. Is that, and some people, I should say that some people feel like th that is why uh, fake news and um, accusations are uh, favored propaganda techniques, is that they do sort of divert you away so that you start looking, you don't look at the man behind the curtain, you don't look at what's really happening. Um, all I'm saying is that quality journalism requires going and talking to people about healthcare. It requires going and talking to students about their education and about student debt. Um, it takes time and we need to make sure that we continue to devote time to that stuff. Uh, I'm very traditional when it comes to the subject matter of journalism and I think all of these aspects of American life need to be talked about in the media all the time. So I guess what I'm saying is that we need to be judicious in the facts that we check. I mean, we don't need to deal with uh, every piece of garbage that's out there and every ridiculous statement. And it used to be, in the old days, like a year ago, <laughs> when people said ridiculous things, we just said, no, that's ridiculous. We're not going to do a story on that, right? We just said, you know, uh, yeah, and, and let's be honest, uh, there are a lot of ridiculous statements out there. There are right-wing hate groups that uh, want to um, kill the Jews, right? There are websites that, that will say things like that. But we didn't do stories on them all the time because they were viewed as being marginal. They were viewed as being on the fringe. So we were comfortable ignoring certain points of view and saying, let's focus on what's really important. So I hope we can find that balance again. It's, it's, it's going to be much harder uh, when, when it's much more part of the mainstream di dialogue. But you're absolutely right. You had a question? Yes. How, how does the New York Times disappoint you? How does the New York Times disappoint you? <laughs> I'm sorry you asked that. Um, so I really do love the New York Times, and I feel I feel like it's you know like my third leg or something. I just wouldn't be who I was if it didn't. Um, the New York Times has disappointed me because I see, and this is totally personal, right? This is not the point of view of the School of Journalism or <laughs> or the sponsor or anything else. Um, I feel like well, I showed you that example of them calling Trump's statement a lie. I think that's a bad move. Um, I think that they are at war with the president. I think that they have made it personal. Uh, Dean Baquet, uh, their executive uh, editor, uh, has uh, said almost as much in that he made some statements saying that he did think that things have changed and that we have to address this president differently. Uh, I guess what I'm advocating for, and I probably didn't do it very clearly in my talk, is that I don't think that we should uh, give him that credit of saying that things have changed, that we still do need to reserve a modicum of balance and restraint in dealing with this administration. So, and, and, I, and I, could, I didn't collect any examples, but if you come to my house, I'll show you the New York Times, and I'll, I'll show you headlines that I think are just sc screaming in your face. Uh, where they've kind of gone. I get the Wall Street Journal at home, actually, and I know, I know the journal is in hot water for its own coverage right now, uh, but I, I find it a just a little bit calmer and a little bit easier to, to read. I, I, I sort of have to, uh, you know, go take a beta blocker after I brought the New York Times. <laughs> yes, the young man in the glasses. Oh, yeah. Today, it's really hard to um, get just objective news. It always has to have some sort of a sway to it, in, uh, whether it's the liberal or the conservative sway. <coughs> and I think a lot of everything's so personalized. It would be really nice to get the uh, Walter Cronkite news, because then I don't think we'd have to be worrying about fake news, because we're getting, and I don't even know if it's getting fair and balanced news so much as what's important is getting objective news. The question is about objective news. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, th you know, uh, thank you for bringing up Walter Cronkite. I mean, uh, Walter Cronkite was an objective reporter, right? I mean, he was a god for, for many of us in broadcasting. Uh, Walter Cronkite was also, he had like a wire machine behind him. He didn't report anything unless the wires reported it first. He was not he would not have survived as a modern reporter. 
he was very much a print reporter who made it into, uh, into broadcasting, right? So, uh, so that's one sense in, in which th that era is, is past. The other, the other thing I'd say is that um, as nice it would be, as it would be to hearken back to that era when we felt like we had three <coughs> objective networks, uh, that was an era of a media monopoly. You could, the, the, they were the only people who had a national audience. And the rest of us uh, were just completely cut out of the discussion. Now we have a much broader menu of news sources. It's much more democratic. I can speak out on Twitter whenever I want to. Uh, <laughs> And I know that's part of the problem, but this is something we wanted as Americans. We like choice. Just go to the supermarket, you know? Uh, so, we, so what I was saying about you know, uh, future shock and everything is that we can't go backwards. I mean, it's, it's interesting to talk about it. I'd be happy to go have a beer and, and, and talk about it. But we can't go backwards. We can't um, you know, uh, put the rubber band back together again. It's, it's, it's broken, and that's, that's where we are. Uh, that said, and I, and I hate to toot NPR's horn uh, because, uh, I, well, I don't work there anymore, but it is where I work. Um, there are organizations, there's, there's room for lots of different voices in journalism, right? Like I said, it's an unregulated profession. There's a broad tent. So NPR sees its role as being very much down the middle, I think. I know we get accused of being uh, left wing. It's just not true. Um, there's also room for opinionated journalism, right? The New Yorker, um, you know, we have the, the new journalism, Hunter Thompson, we had lots of people out there who had a very distinct point of view. There's always a need for these other voices and often they tell you a part of that truth that you don't get from the objective news. So I would say that there are sources of objective news out there today in contrast to Walter Cronkite's day, you can go to the government website and read the stuff yourself, right? That is, that is one of the things people forget about the information world is that the, the government and any advocacy group can command an audience. That did not exist when I was starting in journalism, right? You, would, you were basically uh, in thrall to the TV networks. One of our journalism students has a question. How can the large sources like CNN win the trust back? Um, well, I, I think uh, the, the point of what I was saying is that they should do that um, by, um, I had a slide here, let me show, uh, see if I can find my, why say it when your PowerPoint can say it for you, right? Um, here it is, I skipped the slide. Message to yourself, do your job. And this is an article by a guy in this Columbia Journalism Review uh, by Jack Schaefer. Um, put on your big boy pants, journos, that um, do, the be do the best job that you can. CNN can do that, uh, and they should do that more often, okay? Um, CNN does command a fairly large audience for the cable news world, right? I mean, they, they actually shrunk. But, um, so that's evidence that they are still important. They still have the trust of some people. It's just that a lot of the rest of us, you know, choose not to watch. Um, you know, we in journalism today, we have to be mindful of our audience. We, if you don't get readers, if you don't get viewers, you don't exist. You don't, you will not stay alive and you don't have an impact. So you do have to attract people's interest, but you have to do that by sticking to the tremendous principles of uh, journalistic ethics that you can learn at the UM School of Journalism. <laughs> Seriously, that, that's how that works, is that you're, you're, you're pulled left and right. Uh, Jim can tell you every day in his newsroom, I'm sure somebody in his newsroom is pushing somebody to do a story that they think will get some eyeballs, and somebody else is saying, no, no, we need to do the responsible thing. That's what the profession's about. That if, if you get into journalism, that's what you'll get, that, and that's what's fun, is that you get to have that, you get to participate in that decision-making process. Um, so just do your job. Fred okay. Ashley? In the beginning of your presentation, you talked about good journalism makes you think. 
Today, when you watch whether CNN or Fox News, you've got a panel of analysts, and by the time you're done, it's made you think. Right. They're, they're made you think about what they're thinking. That's their base. Right. And so, one of our challenges, and I'd like to respond to this, is <coughs> America has become lazy and we're not critically thinking about the consequences of what's being discussed. We just look at our own channels. Mm -hmm. Uh, and one more thing, I watched it, I'm a news junkie. I was watching uh, <coughs> President Trump's presentation and I was real angry at the tone of the mainstream yeah. media. Yeah. And what 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 that's all about is he didn't like what the mainstream mainstream media was saying, but he did like what Fox News was saying. Yeah. So it was his base versus right. the mainstream media's base. And so there again right. he, he said we're so divided. Right. So, so you're absolutely right that putting a bunch of talking heads on the air and letting them shout each other isn't really journalism. It's <coughs> entertainment, and I guess if you have 24 hours a day to fill, thank God I don't have 24 hours a day to fill. Uh, I guess you have to do some of that stuff. Um, but I would say that if you s that's what you see on CNN and it makes your blood boil, go somewhere else. Go find a source of news that you trust. And I guarantee you, if uh, I will sit down uh, at the sip and dip with you and we'll surf together and we will find a source of news that you like and you find informative and that you can trust and that will make you a better person. I'm just saying we're segregated and, and you talked about that. We're, and that's what's divided. That's, we're watching uh, our own news sites and therefore forevermore we're not going to be unified. Right. But uh, I can only uh, give you the, the advice of find something that you love. I guarantee you it's there. We have two hands. We'll take the one in the back and then we'll take Ray on, okay? As we wrestled with the uh, fake news uh, problem and so forth, uh, one of the backdoor blessings that I have uh, begun to observe, and I don't know how extensive it is, is I found myself for the first <coughs> time uh, in my adult lifetime fact-checking everything I uh, heard at the RNC and DNC conventions. Uh -huh. There weren't any facts. But a lot of them did. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That we are pushed to uh, explore where where new sources are that can reflect against each other. Well, good for her. You know, again, go out and find. Even if you have to go overseas, uh, uh, you know, via the internet, I think that's that's a great thing. Uh, the internationalization of the news world is a potential uh, boon from all of this. That it's so much easier. Uh, to get uh, news about other countries and uh, from other countries about the United States now than it used to be. Um, so uh, yeah, I would encourage, I would certainly <laughs> encourage uh, young people to go look at other websites. Uh, speaking another language really, really helps. And uh, the, the world is more complex. We should, you know, that's the thing that amazes you when you go travel to other countries is you realize, gosh, they don't like us here, or, or they, they have a very sh different view of the world than we do. So, uh, bravo. Ray Young. Yes, uh, you kind of touched a little bit on it, but I would like you to uh, maybe explain a little bit of this to those of us who maybe worked on school newspapers somewhere. But at NPR, when a story came in from a reporter, what happens to it in terms of the process before it gets on the air? Uh, I don't think all of us appreciate the vetting that's going on and 
and you were little alluded to a little bit, but I appreciate you talking about how does your story get into the onto the air? Uh, sure, <coughs> and this is echoed in a lot of news organizations. It's different in every news organization. Like I was saying, each news organization is unique. You know, it's. Uh, uh, so uh, a lot of story ideas uh, came from me, the reporter, because the presumption in my organization was you, you're on the ground, you're at the Pentagon, in the public schools, uh, at uh, the Federal Communications Commission, wherever it was, you were there, you know what's going on. So good news organizations, I think, are reporter driven. They listen to the reporters and the reporters are listening to the people. They're out talking to people all the time. Um, a lot of ideas came from me, but qu quite frankly, a lot of them would come from my editor saying, we're hearing this. You know, they maybe are listening to other media all the time. So we talked, and that's what most of the journalistic editorial process is about, is talking and trying to figure out how the scrutiny that your editor's bringing and your desire to do a story can mesh, uh, how the concerns of other people in the building who might bring a different point of view. And again, hopefully you have a diverse newsroom. And, and uh, all things considered might have said to me, <laughs> usually what they said to me was, that's great, but can you tell that story in three minutes? You know, <laughs> right? Like that was, that was a real concern is space, you know? Well, yeah, I know you want to do a five-part series on the salmon migration, but we've only got three minutes to fill. Um, so you fought it out most of the time. And this would t go on sometimes for minutes, for a daily deadline, and sometimes for days or weeks for longer projects. Uh, we would argue with one another, and uh, you know, um, Ira Glass uh, was at UM a year ago, and he talked about the fact that it's quite a luxury that they have at their organizations because they have a long deadline. Every time they play a story, so they would run through the story, the radio story, they would play all the sound, they would uh, the, read the script, they would have a new person come into the room who hadn't heard it before. Uh, and so that would maybe, maybe you do that 10 times for a longer piece. Uh, so you get somebody who's going to hear it the way the person on the radio hears it for the first time. Now we didn't have the luxury of doing that for daily pieces, but for longer pieces we would often have somebody come in who hadn't heard the story, who hadn't been involved in all those discussions. You get polluted by your knowledge of the subject. Right? So the co converse to the reporter-driven organization is you need somebody who's going to hear this while they're driving in their car at 60 miles an hour in a snowstorm and is going to be able to understand what you're saying. <laughs> so you would do one more one through and sort of, you know, clean through the thing and then maybe whittle it down and say this, you know, seven minutes, too long, five minutes, that's fine. Um, and yeah, it was a very long discussion and uh, I think the longer the the deadline that you have, the more discussion you're allowed, you're able to have. The New Yorker has fact checkers. They check whether the sun is really is 93 million miles from the Earth. You know, they they, they go through an incredible job. We could never do stuff like that. I mean, because we were deadline journalists, um, and we made more mistakes. You know, I don't think that making mistakes is a reason not to publish. You never ever ever want to make a mistake. But the worst crime, I think, is refraining from talking about a subject because you might possibly make a mistake. That's a real question. Larry, we have another student who has a subject. Uh, you want sure. to a question? How will Trump's presidency affect the work of war correspondents? Um, gosh, I hope there won't be uh, a need for more war correspondence because the um, job of being a war reporter has gotten, it was, it was never easy, but it's gotten very much more difficult. Uh, two things, uh, just to think about it, have come to, have come to pass. <coughs> the American military doesn't allow reporters into combat zones unattended anymore. You have to embed. Okay, so you have to apply for permission now. So uh, when uh, Tom Bowman, my old colleague at NPR, goes to Afghanistan, he has to get permission from the U.S. military and go along with them. So he's under their roof. Uh, they feed him. 
Uh, so going off and doing the kind of Vietnam style war reporting uh, isn't, isn't really possible anymore. But the other thing that's important uh, that's happened is that conflict zones are much less easily defined. The front lines don't exist anymore. So going to Syria is basically, um, uh, it's like a suicide pact. You know, you have no protection over there. Um, it, I'd say that any, I, I don't think that anything the president does unless it uh, applies to the first thing that I said, you know, about embedding and, and the rules, I don't think that he'll have an immediate impact on the job of war correspondents. But I think what will have a growing effect is just the increasing chaos at these war zones where there's no front line and where you can't operate safely uh, and report on both sides. Okay, we have Chris Keel and then we have a young man in the back. So Chris first and then I was really, really disappointed in the media uh, at their professionalism. When you showed that clip, it takes two. They were both going like this, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. like junior high. Mm -hmm. So the need is for professionalism. And I hope these young people don't um, give up their abilities and, and what really took them into journalism in the first place for a dollar bill because there's a feeding frenzy mm -hmm. on the, on the, you know, as the as candidates ran. Boy, was there a lot of money made in the media. And now they're just continuing to go, I don't want to hear every day what the president's doing. I'm not, you know, you, you alluded to, where's the real news? What is happening in our education? Let's have something different. All it is is the same stuff. Mm -hmm. And also, when did Americans start calling their president by their last name? That, that does not work well with me either. Huh. It's not Trump. Huh. It wasn't Obama. It's president. He, there are presidents. And they, they deserve it. It's not my president. <laughs> so so uh, I can. I can speak to the, the last thing that you brought up, which is that uh, that's more of a usage question. So we used to have a rule at NPR that it was always President Bush, President Obama, and then we, um, you could not say Obama. It always had to be the President or President Obama, and that didn't go for any other person on the planet. So, well, so we changed that, and I wasn't part of this decision, uh, to, and I think the sensibility was that there uh, he, he, he's, a, he's a man, or maybe someday it will be a woman, um, that elevating him by having a special title next to him uh, is uh, unnecessary. So that we might refer to Merkel or uh, other leaders by their last names and that there was no reason to have anything separate. I'm just telling you what the news organization's uh, logic is. And, and I, I think, again, every newsroom is different. Every newsroom has either their own usage standards or they uh, appeal to the AP usage standards, which are you know, more broad and get down to using prepositions and things like that. There's a young man in the back that has a question. And if you can't hear, yell and I'll repeat it. Right, sir, um, you said the biggest problem today was ignorance um, in the field, you know, both, I guess, well, as, as consumers of news and reporters of news. And my question to you was, um, with all these major Yeah. How fight the ignorance in, in your selection of news sources? Right. So, you know, um, uh, commercial considerations are not new uh, to journalism. Uh, the Great Falls Tribune is a profit-making enterprise, at least I hope uh, it's a profit-making enterprise, and uh, any newspaper or news organization that doesn't worry about the bottom line uh, won't be around for very long. So th that's part of our life. Uh, even NPR has to worry, uh, which is non-commercial, uh, has to worry about whether or not people are reading it because uh, the member stations that pay for the, the, the systems are, is still based on 
uh, on attention. I don't have any problem with that. Uh, that's why we have journalism schools, journalism organizations to try to make sure that ethical standards uh, re remain high. Um, you know, I, I think that becoming an educated individual is a lifelong struggle. I think we all, uh, trying to become uh, what in my culture we call a mensch, <laughs> meaning you're a considerable, it's, it means a human being, it's, I'm Jewish, this is a Jewish expression, meaning you're like a real deal human being, you're, you're fully formed, you're considerate, you, uh, to get to your point, you show respect to other people even if you don't agree with them. Um, that, that's a lifelong struggle and that, yeah, you're just going to have to keep looking around for the sources of news. If you really feel, like I said to this gentleman here, that there's nowhere out there to get reliable information, um, then I'd say you're not looking hard enough. We pick news that's interesting to students but also important for them to read in, yeah. in a student newspaper. So, uh, first of all, you know, ask your readers. What do you want to hear about? I think that that is one thing that social media has enhanced greatly is that we get immediate feedback from our readers. Um, so while that may feel sort of knee-jerk, it's good to know what people are, are interested in. It's nice to see when your usage spikes uh, for a particular article. Um, but uh, where I used to work, we also operated under the spinach principle somewhat, which was that uh, some news is good for you. <laughs> And you have to eat it, whether you like it or not. Um, so I often did stories that maybe not everybody wanted to hear, but I sort of hoped that they would catch that, you know, little bit of information that I wanted them to get without knowing it. You know, I would sneak it past them or something like that. Um, so I would, I would advocate for some kind of blending of, of the two. That it's, people may not know that they're interested in something, but especially when you're young, your curiosity can be excited by... Uh, new, you know, introduction of new things. But that it always has to be interesting, right? That we're not making encyclopedias. We're not, uh, you know, we're not out to be boring. If you're out to be boring, then, well, I have a number of professional suggestions for you. Uh, but don't go into journalism. <laughs> yeah, I, and, you know, I would say we could solve many of the problems of journalism by just uh, cloning Beth Britton and sprinkling her across the country and bringing up <laughs> another generation. That, not, not everybody knows that you have the, the best journalism, high school journalism program in the state, maybe in the region, uh, at, at CM Russell. Uh, but the other thing I'd say, sort of a closing remark, is if you feel that way and you feel like it's self-destructive to bash the media or bash information and that we really need good media out there, um, tell somebody that. Next time you're in a bar and somebody starts pulling out that old saw, the media did this to us, and you know, um, just speak up uh, because uh, we we can all improve the situation by going to better news sources, by maybe paying for them occasionally, um, and 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 supporting good journalism. So. Thank you.